You're probably watching this video on a device like a phone, a tablet or a computer. But think for a sec, where do you get all these items? The answer, in broad terms, is markets. So hi guys, uh, my name's Alex Sham and today we're moving on to 1.21 of markets and the allocation of resources from GCSE Economics. If you're taking the GCSE course, you might find it helpful to watch some of my previous videos, the first three of the Aqua GCSE Economics course, which you can find right up there. But today we're going to be looking at markets, allocation of resources, and factor and product markets. Let's start off with the basics. What is a market? So a market is an opportunity for buyers and sellers to interact with each other to establish a price. This might sound a bit complicated, but let's break it down. In basic terms, a market is a place where voluntary exchange can take place. And that's exactly what it sounds like, where buyers and sellers both choose this deal of a price to buy or sell a product or service. An example might help explain this, as well as covering the rest of the content, which is allocation of resources and the factor and product market. So, when I go out, I'm usually the buyer. I buy things like cool sunglasses, Rubik's cubes, piggy banks to store my money, etc. This is all me being a buyer in something called the product market. So the product market is where goods and services are sold and bought to consumers, which is me. These products can include things from food all the way to phones. If you look around you, all of these things are probably from the product market as this is the main market that we buy from. Continuing from this example, we can also see how the allocation of resources works. From me buying, as a consumer, buying things like the Rubik's Cube and the sunglasses, it's telling the producers of those products that some consumers, like me, value their items as much as they're selling it for. This type of consumer data is called price signals. So if I take an example of the Rubik's Cube, if no one buys Rubik's Cubes, then producers know no one values the Rubik's Cube as much as the price that they're selling it for. So either they can lower the price or they can make something new, like a different type of puzzle. This is why free markets are so good at the allocation of resources, because they're able to follow these price signals to help produce things that consumers actually value. And they're also following their own self-interest to get the most profit and they make things that consumers value as well as setting them at a price as to give the products to the people who value them the most. This is what's called the invisible hand. Ooh. Now, at this stage, it will also be helpful to mention that the free market economies aren't the only ones out there. There's also things called centrally planned economies. This is where the government takes control and tells people what to produce as well as giving people jobs. But this isn't always so good. This is because the government has a harder time collecting the consumer data of price signals that producers have an easy time collecting in a free market system. This means that usually the government, sometimes in a centrally planned economy, produces things that the end consumers in their society doesn't actually value. One example is Soviet Russia. In this centrally planned economy, the government decides to use their scarce resources to create military equipment and other big equipment such as tractors. However, this didn't really work out because the consumers didn't really want these big military equipment and tractors. They wanted more things like soap and um, sugar and stuff. And this led to a shortage in these consumer products. To be fair to these centrally planned economies, there are some upsides to them. For one, everyone who wants a job gets one. But for me personally, I feel that free market economies work a lot better uh, because I live in one. But even though they're not perfect, they don't require that much government intervention for them to work. As well as producers following their own self-interest using the invisible hand of the free market economy means that they help provide and satisfy society's needs and wants. Going back to the example, let's say I want to get a job at McDonald's just to earn a few bucks. Now, instead of being the buyer in this scenario, I am the seller. I supply labour to McDonald's. This is where 
we get on to the factor market. The factor market is where the factors of production are purchased, which, if you remember from the second video of this series, is land, labour, capital and enterprise. So right now, as me offering to work in McDonald's, I would be supplying labour, which is one of the four factors of production. So I am selling as part of the factor market. Now, the factor market is similar to the product market in the way that it works. It's voluntary exchange all over again. So when I go and see the owner to become, let's say, a waiter in, in McDonald's, I will be bargaining, we will be bargaining for how much he's going to be paying me per hour. I could insist on a wage of £25 an hour, but since the skills required to be a waiter at McDonald's aren't very high, there would be a lot of people able and willing to do this work for much less. But that still doesn't mean I would be willing to uh, sell my labour for, let's say, £1 an hour, because it needs to at least cover the cost of me doing this, including the opportunity cost. If you remember from the previous video, the opportunity cost is the value of the next best thing, the value of the thing that you're giving up to do what you're doing. So the owner could offer me a wage of £2 an hour, but I could always argue that my opportunity cost, the value of the next best thing, I could be working at Pizza and they would pay me more than that. So we could come to a decision saying he'll pay me £15 an hour, which would both cover my opportunity cost, the cost of the value of the next best thing, but um, he also gets some help around McDonald's. Both the factor market and the product market are mostly determined by supply and demand for the price. And we will get that later in 1.3, which is how prices are determined, but I can touch on it right now. So when the demand is high for a product, the price increases because people, there's so many people willing to buy and a limited supply of it that the producers will raise the prices to get, get the most profit possible. And, uh, and when supply increases, then the value of the thing falls because there's so much of it around that it's plentiful. Now, if we have a look at the factor market again, what I was um, selling in the factor market, um, we can see that the supply of labour depends on the number of people that are qualified to do the job. But, as I mentioned, Mac um, being in McDonald's doesn't require much skill, so there would be a high supply. Something like an electrician or an engineer would be a lot higher skills that are needed, so there'd be a lot less supply. This is mainly what determines wages. With a low supply, the wages are higher. For example, a doctor. You need a lot of skills to be a doctor and there is a limited, a low number of people qualified to do that job. So the wages are high. But to be a waiter in McDonald's, the skills um, are pretty low and there are a lot of people qualified to do that job. So the wages are obviously relatively low. In this example of the fact market, we've only had a look at the supply. We haven't yet had a look at the demand. The demand of labour depends actually on the demand of the product the business buying the labour actually sells in the product market. Economists call this derived demand. For example, when there's a heightened demand for McDonald's chips for whatever reason, the value of the labour around the store increases, so there's a higher demand from this business for labour in the factor market. Supply and demand mostly determine these prices in all the kinds of markets, product markets and factor markets. And we will, I promise we will get to those later in this course. But for now, that's it for this content. So we've had a look at markets, the allocation of resources and factor and product markets. I hope this video has helped you learn more for 1.21 of the topic in GCSE Economics. If it did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe below. And if you're still watching, it probably has. So also comment below any feedback you have for me. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. If you're still here, you're probably doing the GTSE Economics course. So you can click on the next video right here. If you're not in the playlist, click right here and just wait a few seconds and it should turn into the previous video. 
If you're not subscribed, make sure to subscribe right here, turn on notifications so that you get told when I release new GCSE economics videos, which I will be doing in the coming weeks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.